Uh, Honeywell also came out about three years ago with what they called then the new analyzer. And it's called a UDA 2182. It actually will take two inputs, and those can be mixed and matched between contacting conductivity, dissolved oxygen, pH, and ORP. It's NEMA 4. Uh, it also has two analog outputs with an optional third, and two relays with an option, to, option for two more if you need it. It's also got an infrared communication port so that you can upload and download configuration in it. It also has calibration history and event history. Uh, it's very good at diagnosed, uh, diagnosing, uh, being diagnostic for pH. It'll give you the slope uh, and the offset value every time you calibrate. Next slide. We won't touch on this much, but uh, the UDA also has, next slide, of either a Ethernet communication port or a uh, Modbus uh, TCP output available to it as an option. Next slide. Uh, calibration we touched on. Next slide. <coughs> uh, the best way to calibrate that is to, um, no, let's go to incorrect calibration, some of the bad things that can happen. Uh, is inadequate stabilization of the measurement, in other words, not allowing the probe to sit in the buffer long enough, inadequate rinsing between the probes, if you've got a reference junction contamination, if your buffers are contaminated, if you've let them sit out for a long time, uh, they could be contaminated. Uh, temperature equilibrium and uh, aging probe uh, not being replaced. The probes can get old enough that they, it's hard to calibrate them. Next slide. A uh, buffer problem, again, you can let the, the buffer get old. Uh, different temperatures. Uh, if you go down halfway down, it says it can take 45 minutes to one hour for a good industrial pH proof sensor to reach equilibrium, especially if, if you're taking it out of a very hot process and sticking it in, uh, in a cold buffer. Um, go ahead. Let's go to the next slide. That's the worst problem there. Um, if sample is easily contaminated by carbon dioxide, such as high purity, the, water, the sample should uh, be a continuous flowing sample. Samples should be taken immediately upstream of the inline pH probe. Samples should be kept at the same temperatures as the process. And if you're going to walk it back to the lab, make sure that it's a sealed container, preferably a non-glass, and that the temperature is maintained. Again, temperature has a major effect on your measurement of pH. Go ahead. Your temperature has a major impact. Next slide. Um, your measuring electrodes uh, can be bad. They can be cracked. They can be old. They can be dirty. Your reference electrode, uh, your reference junction can be clogged. Uh, your reference electrode, the potassium chloride, may not be compatible with the chemistry. Uh, your, your reference electrode may have dried up if you pulled it off the shelf and it's been sitting there for a long time. And again, reference electrode materials could be completed. Go ahead. Next slide. Let's, let's pass that one. Go ahead. Fouling of the measuring electrode. If you Start with detergent. Uh, if you've got oils on a measuring electrode, use isopropyl alcohol to clean them. If it's uh, really nasty, uh, use a diluted 5% or 10% HCl in water. It should be noted here that when, if you're using HCl, that should only be for a few seconds. Uh, I've seen people take them in applications and leave them in HCl for a long period of time, and you can, you can really ruin a pH probe that way. Uh, remember that if your glass electrode is cracked, because uh, zero uh, millivolts is seven, if you crack a pH electrode, it's going to have zero millivolts and will read seven. Uh, if you've a couple things to rejuvenate a reference electrode. If you pull it off the shelf and it is dried up, one of the things you can do is immerse it in boiling water, and in many times that will loosen up the potassium chloride and allow you to use it. Next slide. Uh, let's, uh, I, don't, I think we're, we're running late here. Let's go through the, forget the applications right now. Maybe go through them and hold them for two or three seconds and just move on. Okay, in utilities, of course. Uh, for boiler feed water and boiler blow down. Next slide. Uh, in pharmaceutical, uh, you can use pH and conductivity both, and you're working with the reverse osmosis area. 
uh, for RO, for cation and anion exchange, um, and for softeners. Next slide. Again, in pharmaceuticals, pH can be used in uh, wastewater treatment for removal of live cultures, uh, for chemical destruction, filtration, and final effluent adjustments. Next slide. Conductivity. Uh, we're going to pump through this pretty quick. Next slide. Conductivity is basically a resistance measurement. Next slide. It's a non, whoop, let's back up one. pH is a specific ion. We're measuring hydrogen ion and, and the hydroxyl ion. Conductivity is a non-specific measurement uh, for dissolved salts, dissolved solids, salts, con contaminants. Uh, next slide. Conductivity is a measurement of the ability of a solution to carry an electric current. The higher the conductivity, the higher the current. And I, uh, again, if you're involved with conductivity, you know this. Go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> conductivity is directly affected by the number of dissociated ions in a solution. Conductivity is affected by the quantity and mobility of the ions present, present in solution. And that mobility is generally uh, caused by temperature. And again, conductivity is temperature compensated. Next slide. Applications for uh, conductivity, you can help through this uh, and uh, different applications will pop up. Water treatment, boilers, cooling water, towers, CIP uh, systems, leak detections and heat exchangers. In cooling towers, many times you're controlling the stink or the bact bacteria that can develop there. Uh, conductivity is also used in pulp and paper and in phase change in, in pharmaceutical. Next slide. Next slide. Conductivity is based, again, on the number of dissociated ions. The unit of measurement is micromoles or microsiemens. Uh, there still seems to be some confusion here. A uh, micromole and a microsiemen are exactly the same thing. If you're looking at 10 micromoles, you're taking, taking a look at 10 microsiemens. Go ahead. Next slide. Go ahead. Uh, Rhesus. We're talking about resistivity here. We're really measuring resistance uh, and then converting it to conductivity. Go ahead, change to the next slide. The conductivity of some common substances. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, distilled water is about 0.5 microsiemens. Boiler feed water is someplace between 0.07 and 5 microsiemens. Again, ultra pure water. Ocean water is about, watch the change from the U to an M. Ocean water is 50 millisiemens, so that's 50,000 microsiemens. And so as the water gets contaminated, it goes up in conductivity. If we we're talking about resistance, the numbers would be going down. Uh, ultra pure water at, uh, at 0.1 microsiemen is about 10 megohms. Um, 10 microsiemens is about 100 K ohms. Go ahead, next slide. So you really are measuring resistance and then and converting it back to uh, conductivity. Next slide. Uh, conductivity comes in two electrode styles and toroidal. The two electrode style, what we call contacting conductivity or ultra pure conductivity, really works on a, a you know, positive side and the negative side going back to your analyzer with the with the with the process flowing in between it. And we're, and we're measuring the amount of conductivity from one plate to the other using AC voltage as the power. Next slide. All cells must be mounted so they're directly in contact with the process. Each cell is connected to the indicator or transmitter by either three or four wires. Two wires for the conductivity and basically two wires for the temperature compensator. Next slide. <coughs> 